Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for once again tuning in to our study of John's Gospel. John tells us in chapter 20 that the stories written here were written that you may know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Tonight, as we begin to study chapter 6, and we look all the way through chapter 7, at least the first nine verses, we see the beginning of Christ's third year of ministry. And in this third year of ministry, some events unfold that are monumental. There are events that we still talk about today, we still relate to, we, we harmonize with our appreciation of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And John gives us a first-hand account. It literally takes us to his point of view to see Jesus intimately, not just this not just this larger-than-life character, not just this unapproachable deity, but as a man who was loved and who loved in return, as the Son of God who came here in flesh to be our Messiah, and as John's friend, your point of view is more poignant, and it allows us to see things about Christ that Many people haven't got to see with their eyes, but they can feel and acknowledge with their head and their heart as they read this gospel. So what I hope you've already done is gone to our website, www.tompkinsvillecoc.com. Click on the link that takes you to the online Bible classes and then the link for the Gospel of John. And you've downloaded the study guide for lesson number five. That study guide has questions and blanks for you to fill in from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 10. Well, we looked at chapter 5 last week, and so if you want to go back and watch lesson number 4, it details chapter 5. Tonight, we're going to look at chapter 6, first seven verses of chapter 7. So on your study guide, go to section number 2, Travels Around Galilee. That is where we will begin tonight as we think about what Jesus did. So I hope you've got your handouts, you've got your Bible, and you're ready to go. Let's start reading John 6, and let's go from verses 1 to 15. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself, that be Jesus, knew what he would do. Philip answered him and said, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus then said, Make the people sit down. There was much grass in that place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, they said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up, and they filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men... When they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. The first 15 verses is really the first dividing part of this chapter. And there are some questions that we need to answer just about those 15 verses. Most of you know this story. You've heard it, you've studied it, you've learned about it, and you think to yourself, Neil, it's pretty obvious. I understand that, but I want us to see a couple of things. Let's start with letter A on your handout. And I want you to notice that by this time, the beginning of the third year of Jesus' ministry, his fame and his notoriety had spread, and many people were coming to see him. He wasn't just going. They were coming. They had heard about what he's done. 
They had heard what he said, and they know now, because of what they've seen, what he can do. Jesus was, and I don't mean any disrespect by this, but a celebrity. And he brought people's attention because of who he was and what he did. Now that attention wasn't always, it wasn't always given from the right place. Sometimes it was given because people were selfish and they, they wanted to receive a miracle, witness a miracle. But sometimes, believe this is true, it came out of respect and awe and appreciation. We are inherently selfish people. And I don't think that we need to apologize for that, but we need to understand it. If we understand that our prayers are selfish, if we understand that, that our desires are selfish, then we become people who know it and are able to conquer it. You know, um, if you go to self-help groups, places like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or, or Overeaters Anonymous, in, anything like that, one of the first true tests is to admit I have a problem. People I don't think are very good at doing that, naturally. We sometimes need to hit rock bottom. We need to face the reality of our shortcomings. And if we'll admit up front, humanity's selfish. We long for more. Then maybe we'll slowly begin to grasp the need to be content. It's my two cents, but I think that's two cents worth spending. Notice, if you don't mind, that it says Jesus was there in a mountain. And, and it, if we really look at the text, what we might find is that a better translation is mountainous place. He, he wasn't on a single lonely peak. He was in a place that was full of mountainous terrain. And if you go to Israel today, specifically that Galilean region, You'll see that all around the Sea of Galilee, there, there are what we might call the Kentucky Hills, valleys, um, maybe even an, an occasional holler. And in that area, you have, well, opportunities to preach sermons on the mount. You have opportunities to gather in mountainous places. And so I, I don't want you to think of, I don't want you to think of Mount Everest. I want you to think about Mount Hermon. I want you to think about the, the hills and the valleys around here. They're probably not all that dissimilar to what's going on. If we look at letter C on your handout and on what I am looking at here and the question on the screen is, where did the crowd come from? Now, Scripture gives us some insight. It says there was a great multitude that followed him. So we know that there were some with Jesus. But it also says in verse 4 that the Passover was near. And so there's a good chance that a large group of people were also traveling. and may have been traveling through that region to get to Jerusalem. Now the reason we assume that maybe both of those things happen is because you get a group here that's exponentially large. 5,000 men we're aware of. And I think it's safe to assume that there's many more men, uh, women and children with that group of 5,000 men. This is not just a crowd. It is a large, humongous, overflowing crowd. And the miracle is not just something Jesus did in private. It's something he's going to do at a public gathering of a lot of people. And all of that works together. To help spread not just what he has done, but the power that came behind it. Letter D on your handout brings up something very interesting. And I, I put this on the screen and I put it in your handout because I want us to notice that this is the second appearance of Andrew. And it's the second time we see him bringing someone to Christ. Remember who the first person was? Yeah, you do. It was his brother. And he went to Peter, he said, we have found the Messiah here. When Philip says, I don't know what we're going to do. 200 days worth of work and, and labor and payment couldn't feed all of them just a scrap. 
Andrew says, well, I've got this boy here. He doesn't have much, but it's something. Over the course of the last week, I've noticed that it's very easy for us to be discouraged. Turn on the news, it's bad. You um, talk to people. They're, they're discouraged because of everything that's going on. It's hard to be glass half full people on August 19th, 2020. But don't we need to be glass half full people? As Christians, don't we need to appreciate that we are God's children, God's servants, but, and in the presence of the divine, the, even the unimaginable is possible? I'd like to think of Andrew as the apostle of the glass half full. The man who saw what others couldn't. Maybe not the miracle that would come, but the potential because Jesus was there with him. And he brings that boy. We know the story, don't we? We know what happens. Jesus multiplies the food. Now, letter E on your handout, we've alluded to already. We don't know what the sheer number of the crowd was, but it's obvious to believe there were more than 5,000 people there that day. If 5,000 men were gathered, I think it's safe to assume there would have been many more women and children. And, and by many more, take your best guess. There's no reason to assume or be dogmatic with a number. But if there were twice as many women and children, I'm not shocked. That puts the number at closer to 15,000 people instead. Does it change the power? Does it change the miracle? Does it make it any more significant in my mind? But it is something I think about. How many do you think were there? I think it's a large number. Letter F on your handout. I want to bring attention to what we've seen so far from the beginning of John to where we are here in chapter 6. This is the fourth miracle that Jesus has performed. And every time, crowds have been there to do what? To see something spectacular without completely comprehending its value. To know what's going on. They merely see it. And I hope, I hope that by this point in this time, some who have seen all four of them, or maybe even three of them, are starting to put two and two together. And I think their action, specifically in verse 14 and 15, tell us that some are putting the pieces together. Letter G on your handout, I think, allows us to see that in verse 14, that those men who saw what Jesus did said this is truly the prophet. Letter G lets us see that the attitude of many Jews was one to praise Jesus. In verse 15, do what? Make him their leader, their king. They're, they're thinking physically. They're, they're thinking with their head. But their actions coming from their heart. But it's still here. It's not there. It's, it's here. Look at what great things Jesus did. Let's make him our king. Now, yes, he's a king. But is he the king of their soul? Not yet. He still now is someone they want to be king of their land. The distinction between Christ's kingdom and the kingdom of this world is that Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of consciousness. It has no headquarters here. It has no army here that draws up swords to conquer. What it has here are soldiers who are fighting the eternal battle of good versus evil, right versus wrong, faithfulness versus selfishness, and God versus the devil. We are his servants in a kingdom that is not built in brick and mortar. I'm excited to be a part of a kingdom that will never fade, will never be conquered, whose capital can't be burned, and whose king can't be deposed. That, my friends, is why the kingdom that we're a part of is better than the one they imagined that day in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, we've read through the first 15 verses. Let, let's now go back to Scripture, and let's read starting in verse 16. 
It says that when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and went over the sea towards Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. <coughs> so when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. On the following day, when the people who were standing at the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone, notice what it says. It says that other boats, in verse 22, had come from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread. That when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got in the boats, came to Capernaum, seeking him. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Now the reason we look at these verses here, they serve a, a, as a miracle, a second miracle, and the, the foundational steps towards the big conversation. And this is not the most famous account of Jesus walking on the water. You know that. Do you know that there's another account where Peter walks out towards Jesus? This is John's version of the story. And in this version, what we get is, well, we get, it's, we get almost the Cliff Notes version of it. It, it runs through so quickly that, that we're almost left, I don't know, wanting more. You know, John looks at this and he says, yeah, Jesus walked on water to us. We were afraid, but when we saw it was him, we welcomed him in, and then we were in Capernaum. And then the people who noticed that we got in a boat and traveled to Capernaum saw that Jesus wasn't in the boat. They were shocked because they didn't know how he got there. You know, John recounts this story almost as a, I don't know, almost as a, a, an incidental, anecdotal moment. Yet, it's a miracle. Jesus walking on the water and proving his power over nature. One of the things I want you to see here, and really it's the only big thing to see, letter H on your handout, um, is something very simple. Something simple and easy for you to see. The disciples left Jesus. Where? Well, on one side of the Sea of Galilee. And then the next morning, where was he? He was with them on the other side. Okay? Now, of all the things Jesus did, of all the things he was, and of all the things that make you believe in him, is walking on the water the one you hold on to the most? I don't believe so. And I believe what you hold on to the most is death, burial, and resurrection. It is healing of people like Lazarus and the nobleman's son. Yet, walking on water is one of the qualities that Jesus possessed that allows us to know he is the Son of God. John put that here so that we would understand it's who Jesus is. One with power over sickness and death, nature and the elements. Remember all the way back to John 1. Nothing was made that was not made by him. He is not just the Lord of today and right here and what we know, but the Lord of yesterday, right then, and what we don't know. And I think that's a, a stupendous, wonderful idea that John lets us see. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start now where we, we were taking up at the end. John chapter 6, verse 28. 
Jesus, while he's talking to them about his miracle, walking on the water, how I'm here and you thought I was there, starts talking about spiritual things, not physical things. That was always the key to these miracles, to get them to think about here and here and not here. Spiritual things, things that, that matter in the long run, things that are eternal. And he talks to them about signs. Miracles, things that you see. But he wants to talk to them about what? The food that doesn't perish. That's when he starts in verse 29. After they ask him, what shall we do to work the works of God? He says in 29 that Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. It's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to him, said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him, okay, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to him, do not murmur among yourselves, for no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he was from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. For I am the bread of life. The second time he says that. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. And I love to believe that he's, he, he, he points to himself. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, before we really jump into 53 on, I just want you to notice a couple of things. On your handout, you should be at letter I. And what, what I want you to see is that Jesus' comment about food that endures doesn't it sound like what he said in John 4 to the woman at the well? I have water that what? That will cure your thirst. That will spring up in you a well of living water. Okay? Jesus uses these physical examples to describe spiritual ideas. He's not talking about bread made of flour. He wasn't talking then about water made of hydrogen and oxygen. What's he talking about? He's talking about spiritual, spiritual life. It comes from what? It's right. From him and him alone. His example, his death on the cross, and the life that comes from our devotion to being his. Now, what I want you to see, and I think probably you already get that what the Jews wanted, letter J on your handout, was physical food. They wanted something that they could put their hands on. It was tangible. That's why they wanted to make him king with a crown instead of king in heaven. Jesus wasn't here to provide for physical need. And while he did, and while the Lord still does, that is not our greatest blessing. When I look at my prayer life, 
when I think about perhaps your prayer life, I, I, I make a statement about mine that is an assumption about yours. But if I'm wrong, I don't believe it's about all of us. Our prayers are usually about physical needs. Give us this day our daily bread. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I would love for our first, most prudent, and most, the thing we want the most, to be the spiritual nourishment that comes from God. That, that's what I, I, I wish we prayed for first. That instead of praying for the, the physically sick, that our first prayer would be for the spiritually sick. Maybe yours are. And, and if that's the case, Amen, and I will hope you come and help me pray that. But even I find myself so concerned and overwhelmed with what I need here and everyone else needs here that I at times forget that what we need most is there. And, and here. So if we, and look at how Jesus taught them, Maybe our minds, our hearts, and our head with its prayer life will be turned towards the spiritual instead of the physical. Letter K on your handout really sets the stage for what we're going to see now. So, take your Bible, read with me from 53 down to 58. Jesus said to them, and remember, this is on top of all that we've seen, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now the reason we held off reading that is because it's the hardest part of this to comprehend without big picture passages and the future being a part of your knowledge. We get the benefit of the doubt. We've read the book of Acts. We, we've read about the Lord's Supper, and we see how the weekly memorial we partake of is Christ's body and blood. They had no idea, and it allowed them to look at what was in front of them and maybe not understand it. I've been confused before. You have too. Have you ever read the instruction manual? for a set of shelves that came from Ikea? Of course you have. It's ridiculous. Have you ever tried to, to fix e even a, a, a small Lego thing with your son or grandson? Yeah. Sometimes we read something, we hear something for the first time, and we just shake our head because it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. In hindsight, after the fact, having built it, having experienced it, we start to connect the dots and realize, oh, that's what you meant. I believe, my friends, that these verses, in particular 48 through 58, allude to the Lord's Supper. That's letter K on your handout. As we partake weekly, the fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood, the unleavened bread that represents his body that was broken, beaten, then our Faith and our commitment to him is renewed. And we celebrate what makes us a Christian. Our death, burial, and resurrection in line with what our Savior experienced. And I believe this is an allusion to that. That you will find life in your what? Your faith. In your baptism. And then you will be reminded of it and renewed consistently in your partaking of the Lord's Supper. Do you want to know why we should, on a weekly basis, be reminded of what Christ did for us? 
so that we don't ever forget. Yes, the pattern of the New Testament is to take it every Lord's Day. Not one time a year so it would be special. Not at weddings so that it can seal your covenant. But in your weekly worship service on the first day of the week so that you'll never forget what Christ did for you, what you did in return, and how you are to crucify yourself again every week by bearing your cross, by bearing what? The responsibility of being his and partaking of the sacrifice that was given for you. I love the illusion every week that we are appointed to when we partake of the Lord's Supper that that is symbolic of my Savior who died for me. They couldn't see that yet. And some of them, when they saw it, struggled to grasp it. Notice in verse 59, it says, These things he said in the synagogues he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does it offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? But Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is the devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. John shows us that the apostles are starting to figure it out. Yes, it's hard. And yes, let our eye on your hand out. We know that many disciples left because his teaching wasn't easy. Because it, it, it required um, faith and, and trust, not with, with your eyes that you can see, but with your heart. And, and acknowledging that I don't see and understand everything, but I believe in you who have been sent. By understanding that, we start to see what genuine faith looks like. The very next section, the first nine verses of chapter 7 shows us what it was like for Jesus and his family. And I just want to spend a moment or two to talk about this. It says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brothers, that would be his physical brothers, said to him, Depart from here, go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the work that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even they did not believe in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. There are three simple blanks in section number three on your handout. Letter A is about the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a time that the Jews spent to honor their journey in the wilderness. That's your blank after the escape from Egypt. And it was celebrated around October. Jesus' brothers, letter B on your handout, felt that he should go to Judea to do what? Why should he go there? Well, so that his disciples could see what he's doing. That in Galilee, it's like he's doing it in secret. Who, who, who cares about Galilee? It's sad that his brothers didn't believe, that John points it out. But I'll acknowledge something here, and I want you to see this. Jesus did not blame them. He merely said to them the same thing he said to his mother. In fact, in verse 7 6, I'd say it sounds an awful lot like what he said to his mother. In chapter 2 and verse 4, he told her, My hour has not yet come at the wedding feast at Cana, yet he still performed miracles. And we know here in chapter 7 that he's eventually traveling to Judea. And so we see a dynamic unfold. That even Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God, had people who doubted him. Some doubted him because of who he was. Others doubted him because of what he said. Don't you doubt him today. You believe. Do you remember why we study John? That you, that we, that I may know he is the Son of God. Peter confessed that in chapter 6, didn't he? We have come to believe that you are the Son of God. Why? Because of what they'd seen, what they had heard, or what they believed. Today, what have we seen? Jesus performing miracles. What have we heard? That in him is life. And what do we know? That even though the world may not believe in him, we do. I'm grateful for the time we've been able to spend. I hope that you're enjoying our study of John. It is taking a bit longer than we'd like. But verse by verse, we will study through this gospel. And we will know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Thank you so very much for listening today, for being a part of this class. I look forward to being with you again next Wednesday as we study through the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. Have a wonderful night, my friends. It's good to see you.